دي مشكلة هسه بالنسبة لك طبعا عندك تصريح وين الأوراق بتاعتك ها وين التصاريح انت ما افرض تكون هنا صح بعدين الفيزا دي بتاعت السودان بس ما بتاعت كسلة وبتعمل شنو هنا اصلا انت جاي من امريكا بتعمل هنا شنو اسمعين احنا ما عايزين نعمل لك مشكلة لكن لازم تمشي معنا القسم وين الفيزا بتاعتك وريني ليه وريني الفيزا It began by accident. It wasn't something I wanted to do. It was something I had to do. My father believed the time had come for me to find a life partner, a significant other, a husband. As an immigrant from the country of Eritrea, he had high hopes that I would find a proper Eritrean husband here in the States and believed the best way to achieve that goal would be for me to attend something he called a matrimony event. Oh boy. A matrimony event isn't for people looking to casually date or make new friends. They're looking to wrap this up. It's the equivalent of speed dating, Eritrean style. It was the furthest thing from what I wanted to do. But being the dutiful daughter that I am, I went. <laughs> As you might imagine, meeting half a dozen men scoping you out in the space of an hour and a half is awkward. But it was during this evening something completely unexpected happened. His name was Ibrahim, and he had an incredible story to tell. He had fled Eritrea as a refugee and was immediately kidnapped by a tribe of human traffickers known as the Rashida. Ibrahim told me that thousands of people just like him had been kidnapped in this way. The Rashida would hold their victims for ransom, demanding upward of $30,000 from their families, and would often give less than one week to make good on the payment. If the money was not paid by the deadline, they would resort to shocking their victims with electricity, burning them, raping them, and beating them, all in an effort to extort the families into paying the ransom. If a family could not afford to pay, the traffickers would harvest the refugees' organs and sell them on the black market. <laughs> Ibrahim lost many friends, but counted himself among the lucky few, a survivor who made it all the way to the United States. But as he told me the story, I felt that I was the lucky one. But by now, you're probably wondering, where the heck is Eritrea? And why are Eritreans fleeing the country if there's a good chance they'll end up kidnapped, tortured, or murdered? The answer is complicated. So first, let me introduce myself. My name is Sabrina, and I was born in the United States to Eritrean immigrants. Every year, my family would travel back to Eritrea so my siblings and I could get acquainted with the culture and learn Tigrinya, our native language. Eritrea is a small country located in what is known as the Horn of Africa and has a population of approximately 5 million people. After a 30-year struggle, the country of Eritrea gained its independence from Ethiopia in 1991 and formed one of the most oppressive and abusive governments on earth. But in 1998, Eritrea and Ethiopia once again declared war against each other over a border dispute. When the conflict broke out, my family had been back in Eritrea for six months. 
As Americans, we were fortunate enough to be allowed to take the last flight out of Eritrea before the airport was shut down. But my mother's decision to remove her children from a place about to be torn apart by war came at a cost. Because my father was not on that plane. This conflict, along with other related factors, initiated an Eritrean diaspora, the flight of tens of thousands of refugees out of Eritrea. Meeting Ibrahim was a life-changing experience. The scars he showed me on his back have been seared into my brain. Though I didn't find a husband that evening, I did find something else. A mission. Yeah. After meeting Ibrahim, I told my father I had to see the refugee camps for myself. And of course, as a humanitarian leader himself, as a huge advocate for his people, his response was, Absolutely not. His heart was in the right place. Visiting the refugee camps as an Eritrean American is the equivalent of throwing yourself to the lions. Many refugees have been kidnapped out of the camps by both the Rashida and Eritrean intelligence forces. While the traffickers are only interested in making money, the intelligence forces consider fleeing the country to be treason. They're afraid that those who escape, many of whom are government officials and political activists, will expose Eritrea's corrupt government to the rest of the world. My dad is one of these people. When he was 19, he was imprisoned for two years for speaking out against the Ethiopian regime while Eritrea fought for its independence. In retaliation, Ethiopian soldiers went to his father's room while his father lay ill in bed and shot him in the head. But I'm an American. I've lived a life of privilege. I had to do something. I had to see if there was anything I might be able to do to help. And because my grandfather had died for this cause, and my dad has dedicated his life to this cause, what I said to him hit home. He agreed I could go on one condition. He was coming with me. Can we finish packing? Who, me? What? Oh, no, no. Yeah, we this, this really heavy bag. No, 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 yeah, no, how no, many no. bags do you have? Two? You're going to check in two bags? Both cameras running? Okay. That one recording? Yeah, it's rolling. Okay, red light. Before we left, I decided to interview my father and ask okay. him for his perspective of the refugee crisis. Okay. He told me that being separated from our family during the war was only a drop in an ocean of Eritreans who have been displaced and separated from their families. Three, two, one. I can say, according to UNHCR, we have almost approximately or 450,000 refugees in the neighboring countries. Thousand and then or one thousand. People, they fought 30 years for justice and freedom and democracy. Unfortunately, in 1991, we took our freedom, but no justice, no democracy, no freedom of speech, no freedom of religion. I have always loved my father, but our separation when I was 12, which lasted four years, had created a distance between us. My mother had been my backbone, my rock, my driving force. So I wasn't sure what to expect if we went together, as it would be the first time I would be traveling with him alone. Amnesty International believes that this is a global crisis of incredible proportions and that the international community is not adequately responding to the pressing needs of people who are trying to seek safe places uh, and are fleeing dangerous conditions. The number of Eritrean refugees or people fleeing Eritrea is roughly about 4,000 people a month. This is from the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. In 2016, the European Union reported that it received over 36,000 first-time asylum applicants from Eritrea. Approximately 28,000 children arrived in Italy. Out of this, 25,000 were unaccompanied and separated children. It's 
noteworthy in particular that about 12% of the total population of Eritrea has, has fled the country. I mean, that, that's really remarkable if you compare that to you know, very large countries. In absolute numbers, it may not be numbers that grab your attention, say the Syrian crisis would, but when it's a percentage of the total population, that indicates that something really serious is happening in Eritrea. Eritreans consider number two of immigrants who are crossing the border or crossing the Mediterranean to go to Europe after the Syrian refugees. For not having uh, a conflict and a war in that country, uh, is still for its population to be number two uh, uh, in the world, it's really something unlogic. I was raised in America. To put it in my terms, it's like 35 million Americans fleeing the United States. I asked my father, why would anyone flee their native country and become a refugee at the risk of being kidnapped, tortured, or killed? There are three points, and one is open national service for the youth, and the second one is religious persecution, and the third one is human rights violations in Eritrea. One of the main reasons people flee is because of the obligatory national service, oftentimes national military service, supposedly for 18 months, but the reality is that people can spend a decade or more in national service. And this is a very oppressive form of national service where people aren't paid enough to, to sustain themselves and their families. If they have families at all, most of the soldiers are in service for decades and never get the opportunity to have a family. Nor do they have the skills to allow them to find work once they are finally discharged from the military. I have people I know, 20 years they are under this national service. 20 years? 20 years of their life. By choice? Not by choice, by force. They cannot leave. One of the reasons that uh, many of the people leave is because of the indefinite military service. Why is there this This is another lie. Again, another lie. It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's compromising your credibility and coming up with a pack of lies and trying to give the impression that these are things that exist in the real world. Many girls, when they went there, they have been raped by the military junta, by the colonels and generals in the military. They put them under their service and many of them, they have been pregnant and they have babies, unlawfully babies, you know, by force, this one. By their own people. By their own people. But what if the soldiers just left? They're put into forced labor and are treated punitively if they try to escape from, from military service and in very extreme ways, torture and, and so on. But in addition, there are many grounds for persecuting people for their political beliefs, for their religious identities within the country itself. People are fleeing Eritrea for the kinds of reasons anyone would flee their country. And for those who stay, if they express concerns about the government, they disappear. As a result of these conditions, people's protests against the Eritrean government reached a boiling point. Most of the rallies were met with a violent response, further causing people to flee. And that's why these camps have come to exist. The refugees I wanted to visit are located in Sudan, a country just west of Eritrea in the Nubian desert. In regard to the number of refugees in Sudan, I think it's better to give a little bit background about the nature of the border between Sudan and Eritrea. It's a large border, and there is a tribe that is mixed between the two countries. So this is make it easier for people to flow both ways. And because of that, many refugees have been settled in eastern Sudan. There are also a lot of refugees who um, have been received through the UNHCR and CORE, which is the Commission of Refugees, uh, the, end, uh, the government entity of Sudan that take care of, of refugees. So those two organizations receive those uh, refugee camps when they cross the border and, and put them, take them to uh, certain refugee camps. So that's the one we call registered uh, refugees. And these are the refugees I wanted to see. Hi, 
I'm in the airport in Khartoum. Uh, we just got here. Everybody's nice. Sorry, it's a bumpy road. Oh my God. Our first meeting is at the Araha office to join up with a medical convoy that would be visiting the camps and acting as our transportation. Over the years, my father has spent a great amount of time raising funds with the support of generous donors for doctors to visit the refugees. لتحويلات للمدن الكبيرة اللي فيها أخصائيين أو للخرطوم أو مرات للخارج وما لاقين تحويلة أو ينتظروا في قائمة طويلة لشهور ولسنوات في بعض الأحيان يعني واحدة من المشاكل الكبيرة أيضا يعني تقابلنا هي سوء التغذية الكبيرة موجودة في الأطفال والكبار والحوامل أيضا المشاكل عدم وجود كادر مستغر دائم يعني في المعسكر يعني حقيقة الغافلة طبعا أيام وتمشي وما يكون في يعني طبيب في المعسكر يعني وخاصة يعني حسي في 2016 2017 شهر 6 لما حصلت الرسالات المائية وكذا يعني مشينا للمعسكر ونقرقوا وما في طبيب يعني because of his efforts to help fund the convoy's trip, Dr. Khalifa was able to arrange for us to travel with them. Everything seemed to be shaping up. Until it was time to go. We were told we wouldn't be allowed to film anything in case doing so might jeopardize future expeditions. But telling this story to others was a vital part of our mission. Finally, we had to let them go without us. We are in the station in Khartoum. We are leaving now to Kasala and Gadar. We decided to travel under the radar, secretly, in a crowded bus, for seven hours, hiding our equipment, hiding our intentions. Our destination was Kasala, a city which acts as host to several camps that exist within its borders. Each camp had its own name and characteristics, but all faced the same challenges. So we are on the bus right now. We're on the bus right now. We're heading to the camps. Um, it'll be my very first time going to the camps. I've been waiting for a long time. It's dusty everywhere. Uh, I'm not allergic to anything except dust, and I forgot to bring my allergy medicine. But we'll make the best out of it. Oh my gosh. Oh no mu. It was surreal. It felt like a movie set. The huts, kids running towards us, the stares of people who didn't know whether we were the good guys or the bad guys. I felt out of place, nervous, but excited. I just got to Camp 26. Unfortunately, we're not allowed to record here with our cameras, but um, I'll try to get the best that I can. 
So I'm here at this gathering. This is the opening of a medical convoy. There is over a hundred people here waiting to see the doctor. Not only are they waiting, they're fighting to see the doctor. They're so desperate. They need help. They haven't been checked for years. They have deadly diseases and they have no help. So everyone is here, lined up, fighting each other just to see one doctor. With no access to health care, many have waited years to see a doctor. So when a doctor finally arrives, it's a survival of the fittest situation, crowding and pushing to be first in line. she needs chemotherapy. Uh, and also, we will repeat, uh, she needs ultrasound and the biopsy. So desperate to see the doctor, many patients can sometimes forget themselves. Tempers flare in the midst of such need. The chemotherapy for non-Sudanese, uh, they don't give them the medication free. For Sudanese it is uh, almost free. Uh, because she has no Sudanese, they ask her to pay. She cannot pay. And it's expensive. Uh, expensive. This is lymphoma. It's very common in the lymph node around the aorta. But treatable. Treatable, yeah. 100% treatable. Treatable. Because she is not non Sudanese, she cannot, she cannot afford the asthma. The donations received from people abroad have not been enough to treat the half million refugees. The six physicians in the convoy are only able to provide medical care for two weeks. They need more donors from individuals, international organizations, and government institutions to support health care. This child is too young to have learned about how the world changes every day and how the people in it can pass away. Eventually, we all learn it. Some when we are young, some when we are old. But for him, in this place, he learns it immediately. As part of the medical convoy mission, a pop-up pharmacy was created to make it easier for the refugees to receive their prescriptions instead of having to commute to the nearest clinic. So we're here at the pharmacy with the medical convoy. Um, they are providing a lot of medicine for the refugees that are waiting outside. There's approximately 50 refugees out there. Um, unfortunately, they don't have enough medicine for everyone. Everyone has a different health issue. There are two amazing doctors here, Dr. Amuna and Dr. Abdel Wasif. Um, Dr. Amuna also works in the hospital. She's here with us today. The shortage of medicine is unfortunate, and we are looking for people to help us provide more medicine for them. So hopefully we can. Thank you.
Some refugees are too ill to make it to the pharmacy, so Dr. Khalifa visits many of them in their huts to provide them with much needed treatment. عندهم مرض وراثي هي هيريديتري ديزيز ليتر اون لانه تجد فقد الاحساس وكذا هيحصل لهم نوع من عدم انتظام ضربات زي هاف اريزمياس ان هارت زي لوس سنسيشن عند سويتين يعني حسنا احنا لما نمشي في الشمس نعرق ويعمل لنا كونديشنين براه الناس دي فقدوها الصفه دي ما في ما يحس بجروح وايضا ممكن الطفل اسمه يعدي الاصابع وكذا وتنقطع وهو ما بيحس بها. A lot of injuries and his finger is almost amputated here. Even the, the wound is penetrating to the bone. Later on it will be amputated. جروح في الكرعين هنا نتيجه فقد الاحساس وده ممكن اذا وصلت العظام الانسان هيحصل له بتر. نفس الشيء نفس الشيء فبالمثل مع الجروح دي مع التراب ده طوال البكتيريا هتعمل له التهاب وتخش في العظام اذا دي اسره يعني عندهم مرض وراثي ماتوا منهم اثنين والان الاثنين هذا الطفلين ديل عندهم مرض وراثي يتسبب في فقد الاحساس زيارات مطعنا من أمريكا من أمريكا أنا مدلومة 
من كل راعه مدلوب كفر له يا كعك كفر له بليا بقعد انت اه اعطيك كفر له بليا As I continued to make my way through the camp, the same thought crept into the back of my mind. Many refugees from other nations are at least receiving attention and at times respectful care. Why aren't these people receiving the same support as refugees from other nations? I think the Eritrean refugee crisis has gotten less attention than the Syrian crisis, for example, because you don't have a war that's on the front pages. You don't have the kinds of dramatic footage, basically. You actually have a half a million Eritrean refugees out there, but they've been fleeing them quietly over a long, long period of time. And the camps, such as they are, are in extremely out of the way places, like the Kasala area of Sudan. Eritreans themselves are oftentimes reluctant to speak out because they're afraid of retribution for family members inside Eritrea. One of the human rights abuses that we've documented is the retaliation, the retribution to family members in Eritrea for dissidents who have fled the country. The government controls the media through the internet and through the printing houses. Journalists continue to be harassed, arrested, detained. They continue to be disappeared. Media outlets that do try to operate are constantly shut down. Controlling the sources of information, controlling access to the country itself. Making Eritrea one of the most dangerous countries on the continent for journalists in 2016. So I'm at Camp 26 right now, I'm getting ready to leave, it's uh, sunset time and um, we were advised to leave by sunset because they don't have electricity and it's not safe for us to be here in the dark and it makes me sad that I get to go to my hotel and everyone else has to stay here. This is the life that they live every day. Now he has a uh, chronic cough with uh, sputum and his lung uh, is very, very bad, very bad. Almost left side full of the infection. As Dr. Khalifa and the medical team continued to make their examinations, I was struck by how the needs of each camp seemed to be greater than the one that came before it. The sheer number of people needing treatment was overwhelming. I wondered how the doctors were able to maintain such optimism in a situation that seemed so hopeless. After meeting with these families, it started to become more and more clear if even a minimal nutritional standard could be reached, if even the most basic preventative care program could be established, so much of this suffering could be avoided. In an effort to help, my father and I went to many of the patients who could not make it to the clinics and made a record of their symptoms for the doctors before they would visit. So this is where Osman Aruf used to live, this little hut that collapsed, uh, and he lived on the floor. He still managed to sleep on the floor. Uh, until his daughter decided to invite him over to her house, in which he lives now.
ما يدوي الغاصة ما يدوي الغاصة حتى الكريت حقنا أنا متجول ودور قربه وجا راجع ولا حفصة ما مثبتين استغفر الله العظيم استغفر الله أنا بزح شقرة لأن بس أول تعنا بالليل تعنا بالليل تاخم زوها ناي بس تمر عيا ولا دير خوكن أو ولا تكون ناي رخصة ناي ما هتأنا لأن رخصة ناي ما هتأنا لأن وبزي قدا ناي قدا عملية جيري عرفت اللي بزي حمل وزي بس تجير الله خيس الرح كم جير حمام من لأن زروفي بالليل و سدراي بالله وزي بس بزحت عبر لنا أنا بزق عليكم تتحوى وريني كم دي عمل جيرك بزي؟ أبزع عدي عصر سلسة عامة غيري أبزع عدي حبرات من قصات دقوز وخوتو غيري كم سجيبتي؟ أوه لن كم سجيبك الله؟ أوه خمس أدهار هاري أكو؟ لا أنا دخل دخل قلنا يتحكم الناقي؟ صباح دكتور خليفة شو ملو؟ ولا حجة هم أنا تخيرك؟ ما نشتي نشتي ورقات قانت يتكم هاوني نموت هاوي؟ ها؟ لا أنا بلن ولا حنت فلتة حج مباري زيا حجي كات زيا حجي دكتور خليفة أنا قو؟ هو جميل يسديد النساء يفول له شو ما يحزيا جميل أمان يسديد النبليه نقول خير كيو أفاو سامس يوم اللو دعني فاو سامس اللي كي وقلت أقول كيو مسوق بخوي أم مالتي هرا نحاول مع الخط مع الصيغة الموسى قن كله نقدر حكمه نقول لازم خير وصل ذي كله بعث بزيحه أم الله هزي خير يا خلهم عالت تخذ كي الجوين تخير كي مسك مسكو بخوي تري عز أوه هذا الدكتور خليفة أنا خالي عيد حازي ورقة خمسة عجل كل شيء كتاب بيجي دكتور خليفة خد تليانير خزار وبطرة يبليه دكتور خليفة يني هاي بالبس دكتور كتاب ورقة تبي يشعر هرى 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 إيش المرض بتاعه والله يتولد ولادة طبيعية بعد ثلاثة شهور بيجيو تشنج كانت من التشنج الحالة دو اللي قالت لي بش... كان بيشنج كثير ها بعد ما مشى اليد اليمين والكرة على اليمين دي بقت ما بتتحرك دكاترة ده مشى لا ده... يعني دلك ده في ما خلوا حاجة وما في تحسن بيسمع لكن ما بيتكلم والله يعني نحن كان في مساعدة بس دارين يعني يمشي ويلقى علاج برا كان لقى علاج ويتعافى وهو ما كويس معنا A lack of health care and proper nutrition is the immediate problem, but the real issue over time is education. <laughs> This is the secondary school in the Umgargur camp. It's so nice and I'm so happy to see they have this. We were able to meet with the school's principal to learn more about his school. How are you today? Yes. 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 Yes.
انتوا بتتكلموا انجليزي بتفهموا انجليزي ولا لا؟ شوية؟ انا ماي نيم از سابرينا، ايش يعني هذا؟ ما شاء الله انتوا بتفهموا انجليزي شوية صفا صفا والله احنا ما عندنا مدرس انجليزي ثابت عندنا مدرس انجليزي زي ما تقول يعني ثانوي متجول ما عندنا حاجه تقريبا تلاميذ اللي يمشوا يشتروا كراديسهم وابلام وكتبهم ما في حاجه يعني هسه احنا تلاميذ دي ما عندهم كراسات ولا عندهم كتب ولا عندهم ابلام ولا عندهم اي حاجه which is exasperatingly obvious While I was there, I saw only a handful of books and not enough educational tools. No computers either. But even if there were, there's no electricity. Adding solar electricity to the schools can provide a comfortable environment for the children, as well as provide work opportunities to the men and women who can become self-reliant using solar energy. Okay, okay, hello. She means the electricity. Many of these schools have 65 students sitting in a single room in 100 plus degree heat. Not the most productive learning environment. And she suggested that air conditioning should be provided for the younger students. مليون ومية احنا ديل متعاونين نديه بحدود يعني ميتين مية وخمسين لا عشر دولار مليون ومية مية دولار وشوية اي مية دولار صح مية دولار تغارن بين احنا عشر دولار وبين مية دولار انا عندي انا زي يعني عندي أربعة طفل وأنا يعني هيد ماستر في المدرسة تخيل كم حاصل إذا أنا أخليها وأنت تخليها من يدرسها Many who teach here stay only because of their personal commitment to the students قلت لهم إذا أنتم ما عندهم مجبة الواحد يمشي في البلاغ وعيش إذا خلوك بالسالة البابة على المويدي تدخل العيش الناس في البابة وتبقى بموية Though there are organizations in place to help prevent situations like this from happening, often the efforts don't reach far enough. Unfortunately, um, the UN in, in, in the UNHCR in, in Sudan, and I don't know if this is part of their mandate, but they do not go beyond uh, intermediary uh, uh, school or uh, elementary school. And this is based on the fact that refugee camps are temporary. The reality is not like that. In fact, we find that two generations may live in a refugee camps. And the Eritrean refugee camps are a good example. The first wave of refugees was from 1967. Uh, so you have here uh, about two generations that have been born and raised in that camp that this refugee camps that we built the first high school in uh, was built in 1985. So you can imagine for 28 years, there was no high school. There was no a single graduate from that uh, refugee camp uh, from high school. And that is something sad. We are losing a generation. Hi. But there are signs of hope. Despite the obstacles these students face, I was struck by their resilience. 
Despite the limitations of the schools, they are still eager to learn. They still come to school because they want to. They want to succeed. The surest way to put an end to the refugee camps is from within, to produce young adults with the skills that will make them viable, accepted, and sought after by the rest of the world. <laughs> At this point, our time in Sudan was almost finished, but we had one more destination we were considering. Shagara, the oldest Eritrean refugee camp, is host to over 30,000 people. It's considered to be the most dangerous camp of all, with the fewest protections. And what about the women? This journey is particularly very difficult for women who are extremely vulnerable. Women are repeatedly raped throughout the journey. Unfortunately, uh, in the recent years, there are many incidents where people smugglers and sometimes even Eritrean intelligence forces are coming to this camp and pulling refugees from the uh, reception centers. They were very sadistic, that's all I can say, because if you are kidnapping a 12-year-old kid, you are raping her, gang raping her, six, seven men, at the same time you are on phone, on the phone with her mom or her father while they are listening and you are demanding $40,000, $50,000 from a person, which Eritreans, we are probably the poorest people on earth. Of course, the, the, you cannot say that the one degree of torture is less than another. It's all torture at, at, at the end of the day. But women especially tend to be more vulnerable because they're raped multiple times by multiple um, traffickers and they're put in very humiliating situations and positions while they're in captivity and during the journey. So why leave these secured camps? Both these first countries of asylum do not provide livelihood opportunities. There are limited education opportunities, limited uh, restrictive movements for refugees. And I think even though they are provided with security, not being able to be self-reliant pushes a lot of people to move onwards. I assumed my father would insist that we not go. We were almost done and we were still alive. Going to Shagarab meant putting everything at risk. But there was another reason. Shagarab is the site of the first female high school in any of the camps. Here, in the most unlikely of places, females have the same access to an education as the males. My dad had been so calm as we visited the other camps, which had made me feel safe and secure. But here, at the checkpoint outside of the camp, I noticed a change had come over him. There was something different about his eyes, something I had never seen before. It was fear. And then I realized why. We were being watched. My dad is well known for his opposing views of the Eritrean government and his outspoken public speeches. He had already been imprisoned, and his father was a martyr to the cause. Because Shagarab is near the Eritrean border, he knew Eritrean government forces were bound to see us. If he were to be picked up, it would almost certainly mean prison for my father, which was the same thing as death. As his daughter, I was also in danger because they would kidnap anyone related to the person they were after. So the question was, would they recognize him? As I whispered that I was certain our lives were officially over as we knew them, he did the strangest thing. He started to tell me a funny story. Smiling and laughing, he acted as though he didn't have a care in the world. I did notice that he spoke in Tigrinya, 
so that the soldiers would understand. I didn't know what would happen. All I knew was, I was so proud of my dad. No matter what happened to us, even if this was our last moment of freedom, it was okay. And then, suddenly, they left. Here, in the darkest part of the darkest place in the camps, we found one of the brightest lights. Um, I shot those images on my iPhone because there was no way to get the cameras in there. At one point, the girls asked the men to leave the room. I don't have footage of what they said. They wanted to tell me that they have no feminine products for that time of the month. After leaving Shagarab without incident, my father and I returned to Kasala. I was thrilled that we were out of danger until a man caught me filming with my cell phone. He asked for my passport. My father asked him who he was. He pulled out a badge, identified himself as an undercover police officer, and told us to come with him. As we followed, I whispered to my father that I was worried the man might actually be a disguised member of the Rashida or the Eritrean intelligence forces. My father said we had no choice but to follow, because now he had our passports. As he was driving us God knows where, my whole life flashed before my eyes. I thought, best case scenario, my father and I would become political prisoners. Worst case scenario, unwilling organ donors. We arrived at what turned out to be a police station. I had no idea why we were here. I didn't do anything. Just shot some video on a cell phone. Something I always did in America. But this was not America. And here, over the next several hours, we were asked the same questions over and over again by six officers, one after the other. Each one of them was pleasant and calm, but I had the lingering feeling that something was wrong. Eventually, one of them asked for my phone. I refused. My father looked at me as though I was crazy. I explained that I had private photos of me, without my hijab, my headscarf. The real reason was that I had photos of the camps, and with their strict no-camera policies, I was not about to walk myself into jail. Finally, my father caught on and asked the officer to respect my privacy. He went on to explain that in 1976, he had visited the schools in Kasala, and we had returned to see what further steps might be taken to improve the school. 
His daughter had wanted video of this beautiful city to take back with her to the United States in remembrance of her trip. Impressed with this explanation, an officer stamped our documents and let us go on one condition. We couldn't return. I got everything out of this. Because I realized, even though we met so many people who live in danger and poverty, they still have hope. <laughs> there are many ways we can help improve the lives of these refugees, but education and health care are immediate necessities. Every child and every woman deserves to get an education. In order to stop the refugee migration, the Eritrean government must reduce the military conscription and enforce the original two-year term. If they did just that, refugees will stop fleeing as it is the number one reason. Eritrea's most recent peace agreement with Ethiopia in July 2018 is historic news for us to celebrate. After two decades of conflict, which led to the indefinite mandatory military service in Eritrea, the state of war that existed between the two countries has come to an end. What does this mean for the people of Eritrea? Will the end of the conflict clear the way, not only for the end of mandatory conscription, but a return to the democratic provisions in the constitution that were suspended? Does it mean Eritreans now will receive justice, hearing rights? freedom of speech, and freedom of religion? Does it mean the hundreds of thousands of refugees who have been waiting for decades to return to their homeland will have the chance to do so without retaliation? I hope so. There is no better time to remember the forgotten refugees in all the refugee camps in East Africa and worldwide. The Eritreans are a people that have been oppressed, disenfranchised, and shut out from the world stage. They have been forgotten and left in the dark. Although my return to Sudan has been rejected by the Sudanese government, I am committed to shine a light on this darkness. Even my crowdfunding effort to fund this documentary hit a roadblock. And I have just two weeks left to go, about $12,000 to reach. I have worked day and night on this campaign. I have called everybody. I've really put so much effort into it. So guess what? This morning I wake up to this email. And was temporarily taken off their website because it was deemed to be too risky to remain on their platform. It was only after thousands of people demanded the funding drive be allowed to continue that I was able to finance this film. Sorry, I cry when I'm sad. I cry when I'm happy. It's so strange, but they reversed their decision. And then, there was you, my dad, my Baba, the time we spent together, the memories we created. No, it's fine. It isn't my cause. It isn't your cause. It isn't my grandfather's cause. It's our cause. I'm so proud of you. This trip changed my relationship with my father and brought us closer together. But for those we left, change has yet to come. There's so much work left to do. For my part, I'm trying to bring an awareness to the world that lives outside these barbed wire fences. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. With an education, Every child can grow up literate and capable of contributing to the positive development of the country they call home. Basic health care will allow them to thrive, to attend school, and have healthy children. Eritrean refugees are ready, willing, and able to become self-reliant, but they need the tools necessary. Let's give them their wings so they can fly. If you're interested in being part of a campaign, please visit www.refucare.org.
خبتت فقيت عاستوب علي بس كيف سيك أخير عبكي نعزامي